Okay, uh, we are uh, in still chapter 14, I believe, and we started talking about titrations last time, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe we uh, talked about this titration here, uh, which was a strong acid, strong base, and we talked about one uh, like, obviously, hydrochloric acid, uh, which is a strong acid, and sodium hydroxide, uh, which is a strong base. And obviously here we will form some water and sodium chloride here, water and a salt. Now I believe last time we sort of went through uh, the different parts to this titration and basically sort of how you would, <clears throat> excuse me, how you would calculate the pH at the different parts. Pretty much in every titration curve, uh, there really is sort of four distinct areas on it. Uh, as we talked about last time, the very initial here, and again, just for reference point, uh, in the burette there is the sodium hydroxide, in the beaker is the acid in this case, so we are dropping base into the acid in this case. At the very beginning, before we add any sodium hydroxide, really the only thing that we have in the actual beaker is a strong acid. And because it's a strong acid, you could go right into your pH equation at that point. You don't have to be concerned about uh, adding volume and moles or anything like that. So you could just use, bless you, the concentration of the strong acid uh, because it's a strong acid and probably in a lot of cases will be a monoprotic acid, which means it just has one H to give. Uh, whatever the concentration of the strong acid is, obviously will probably be your H plus concentration. The second part of the titration curve, which is really important, is once you kind of start adding any sodium hydroxide until you get to the equivalence point. In that region, as we talked about, you really do need to do an ice table. And you do need to do that ice table in moles, because again, as we talked about, whenever you're adding volume, very much like with buffers, molarity will continuously change. But what doesn't change really is the amount of moles that you have present. So again, make sure you got to do that ice table in moles. Once you do the ice table in moles, as we talked about, it's really important to make sure you then convert back into molarity using the total volume. What you'll be left with at this point is essentially still the strong acid. Uh, so once you're done with the ice table, because the strong acid at this point is sort of like the excess reagent, the sodium hydroxide that you're adding is like the limiting reagent, you will always be left with the strong acid, which means you could get the H plus concentration and then obviously go into your pH equation at that point to get to your pH. At sort of the third point in this type of titration is actually the equivalence point here. The third point. And remember that the equivalence point is the point in the titration where the moles of the acid equals the moles of the base. So technically speaking, if you did an ice table at the equivalence point, when you got to the equilibrium line of that ice table, you would have none of the strong acid. You would have none of the strong base still left. Really, the only thing that you would have left pretty much at that point besides water is the salt. And that salt did come from a strong acid and strong base, which, as we know, is basically going to make it a neutral salt, right? And that is why in this particular example here, we do see that the pH at the equivalent point is going to be a pH of seven. It will not go through hydrolysis or anything like that. So in this type of titration, you don't really even actually need to do an ice table there at the equivalence point. You should safely know that you will have just a salt that will not go through hydrolysis and should end up being neutral. At that point, you know, if we were using some type of indicator, it would have probably turned color, but maybe that doesn't stop you. So you continue past the equivalence point here. And that's sort of the fourth part of it. That also involves really, you need an ice table at that point, just like any other ice table here, you wanna make sure you do it in moles. But we do get sort of a change that occurs after you go past the equivalence point.
So before the equivalence point, it is the acid that is the excess reagent. But once you go past the equivalence point, it's actually going to be the sodium hydroxide that is the excess reagent. And the acid becomes like the limiting reagent. What that means is you're going to use up pretty much all the acid. And what you'll be left with basically is two things. You'll be left with the salt, which we just talked about is going to be neutral. And you're left with sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. So the purpose really of the ice table past the equivalence point here is to figure out how much strong base you have left over. You do need to again, convert it back to molarity at that point. That would probably get you to like a POH and then to a pH type of situation as you could get the OH minus concentration from the strong base. And again, that would allow you to calculate your POH and then calculate your pH. So there's really these four sort of distinct points along a titration curve. And you know, you, if you kind of know where you are on the titration curve, it does a lot of times make the calculation a lot easier. Uh, you should have an idea of what you should be expecting in terms of pH. We also talked about that this is also very common as you approach the equivalence point, you typically do see sort of a jump in pH to the equivalence point and then past the equivalence point, you kind of see another jump in pH as you go through it. And what that means is as we get near that equivalence point, we are adding not a lot of volume, but we are changing the pH a lot. And as we talked about, I think last time, that's why, again, when if you've ever done a titration before and you just like added a drop or two and it went from like, for example, no pink using phenolphthalein to like super dark pink, that is really why, because the indicator works off of a pH range. So even though you only dropped a couple of drops in there, that was enough to change the pH a lot. And that's why the color changed so drastically, even though technically speaking, as we talked about last time, if you kind of go down, you know, no matter where you ended up along here, you know, that's going to get you pretty much the same equivalence point volume. So it wouldn't make a big difference. Uh, what we did talk about though, is it wouldn't make a difference. You weren't really being careful when you're doing your titrations and you just opened it up and then shut it and it got that super dark pink because that could also be super dark pink over here, which if you came down is very, very far from where the equivalence point volume should be. So if you're doing the titration, you're, you're super very careful as you approach the equivalence point and kind of go drop by drop or half drops as you approach the equivalence point. Um, you know, even if the indicator color goes kind of really super dark, like for example, phenolphthalein goes super dark pink, um, you're probably okay in terms of the volume is more important in there. Any questions on any of those stuff that we talked about last time? I believe this is where we left off, yes? Okay. So why don't we just try one of these just to uh, get an idea of what we should do here. So why don't we say, oh, I don't know. <clears throat> Let's do, Let's say we did a titration of uh, 25 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. What is the pH after 27 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide is added? All right, take a minute, see what you come up with. Uh, so that's a good place to start. So to get our moles of HCl, we're going to convert our volume into liters. We're going to times it by the molarity here. Liters here will cancel, and that is going to get us 0 0.025 times the 0 0.1, 0 0.0025 moles of HCl. We'll do a similar calculation here for the sodium hydroxide, 0 0.027 liters times our molarity of 0 0.1 moles per liter. Going to get us uh, 0 0.027. 
2.70 moles of sodium hydroxide. Any questions on how to calculate moles here? At this point, we can then actually do our ice table that we need. So it's just going to be our reaction of our hydrochloric acid and our sodium hydroxide here going to give us some water and our sodium chloride. So initially here for our HCl, we got 0 0.0025 moles. We got uh, 0 0.0027 moles of this guy and nothing of this guy. So if you were not sure where you are in the titration, your ice table here can help you. Remember that this is what we are starting with. This is what we are adding. So in this case, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is it less than, equal to, or greater than what we started with? It is greater. So does that mean I'm before the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, or after the equivalence point? So again, I am adding sodium hydroxide to the HCl, which means if I've added more moles of sodium hydroxide than HCl, where should I be in the titration curve? I should be after the equivalence point, right? I'm basically just dumping sodium hydroxide into the beaker. So we are after the equivalence point. That's important because what happens at that point is we should know that the acid now is really our limiting reagent and our sodium hydroxide is the excess reagent, which means when we get to the change, what's going to happen is pretty much we don't have enough acid to handle all that base coming in. So the change is actually going to be the acid here. A reminder, just common sense tells you, you should not have a negative concentration so don't go with the negative number there, right? That gets you the negative number. That means at equilibrium, we basically used up all of our strong acid, which is what we would expect to happen. We will have some of our strong base left over because we're just dumping it in. And we also have this guy left over. First off, any questions on the ice table here? Now, again, if you're not sure what to do at this point, we're at the end of our ice table. So the first thing you really want to do is convert everybody back into molarity. To do that, you need the total volume, which in this case is we started with 25 milliliters. We added 27. So that's a lot amount to do in my head. So I'm going to do 25 and 27. That says a 52. Sounds like a winner. That is our total volume that we've added to this point. That means we're going to take each of these guys and divide it by 0 0.052 liters. That gets us uh, 0 0.0002. If I didn't add an extra zero there, hopefully not. Let's try it again. 0 0.00. 27 minus 0 0.0025 divided by 0 0.052. This is approximately 0 0.00385, we'll call it. And over here, 0 0.0025 divided by 0 0.052, 0 so we've now converted it back to molarity, which is what we should do. And again, if you are still not sure what is going on at this point, don't overlook your ice table. We could just simply circle the two things we got left over. Since we do have two things left over, the first thing we want to decide is, are these things related to each other? Are they? They are not related to each other like a buffer. So this is not really related to each other. Uh, sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide, no real relationship other than they both have sodium, basically. Yeah, so it's just a spectator on. Right? 
what would make them related basically is if you ended up with like a buffer situation where you had something like a weak acid on one side and a conjugate base on the other or a weak base and a conjugate acid. So that's, you know, kind of the Bronsted Lowry definition of being related to each other would then make you have something like a buffer, which is not the case here. And that's important because as we talked about last time, very common people end up with two numbers and go Henderson Hasselbach needs two numbers. I'm just going to throw it into there to get my pH. So we do want to kind of identify what these things are. We clearly talked about this a second ago. That is a salt, which comes from a strong acid and a strong base. And as we talked about, basically a neutral salt. So we don't even really have to worry about this guy here. Just like when we're at the equivalence point, we don't have to worry about it. So really what we're left with is just our sodium hydroxide, which is again, a strong base. And because that's a strong base, that means that this number that we just got is really the hydroxide concentration. So that is really our hydroxide concentration. And that's really important because that will obviously allow us to calculate the pOH, not the pH, but the pOH minus the log. 0.00385 and minus the log 0.00385. Looks like it may be a 2.41. We'll go beneath it, 2.41. So now also a very common mistake is if you happen to thought that was your pH value. Again, it should not make sense because if that was a pH, that would be an acidic pH. And luckily for us, it is not an acidic pH. Uh, it's actually a pOH value. So to get to our pH, going to be 14 minus our pOH. And that will give us 14 minus 2.41, which gives us a pH of 11.59, we'll call it. And that pH is definitely basic which is exactly what we would expect to happen when we go past the equivalence point and we're essentially just dumping base into the solution. We should expect a pretty good jump in pH. Remember our equivalence point is like as pH is seven. That's only like two milliliters past it. So we're definitely going to have a pretty big jump from the addition of our strong base. Question on that there. I think this is actually the example that they have here. So if we went to the table, 27 is like in the middle of those two numbers. And our pH is 11.59, which is in the middle of those two numbers, which is pretty good. Any questions on strong acid, strong base titration? All right, so the next type of titration we're gonna talk about is a little bit different. It involves actually a weak acid and a strong base. So let's take a look at that. If I could get there, where's that thing? There it is. So a titration like something like this, which is acetic acid, which is a weak acid, and sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. The setup here is pretty much the same thing. Up in the burette is our sodium hydroxide, adding to our beaker that has our acetic acid. So again, we're adding base to acid. We see a typical sort of S curve like we saw in the previous one. We also see because it's a weak acid, perhaps the pH starts a little bit higher than it did with our strong acid, but we're starting at an acidic pH. As we continue to add base, we see the pH start to rise. We also see a similar sort of vertical rise heading towards the equivalence point along with a jump to the equivalence point and then a jump in pH after the equivalence point. And just like before here, we do see it sort of level out at the end. There are just like the previous titration, the same four important locations here, which is once again, before we start, after we start adding to the equivalence point, once again here at the equivalence point, and the fourth important part is obviously past the equivalence point when we keep adding. So we're going to sort of talk about how we would get the pH at each of these four different parts along this curve.
And we're going to kind of just do it like we did last time. I'm just going to kind of make up some easy numbers and we're going to talk about what's happening at each spot. So let us do that first off here, which is the uh, first spot here, I think. So at number one here, which is uh, before we start to titration, So we have not added, no sodium hydroxide added. So in this particular case, before we start the titration where the sodium hydroxide is up here, our acetic acid is down here. The only thing that we have is a weak acid. How do we calculate the pH of a weak acid? It is like we did earlier in this chapter. It is basically a Ka problem at this point. You would take the weak acid like acetic acid. You would dissociate it into H plus and acetate. We would do an ice table. Would this ice table be done in molarity or moles? At this point, we could do it actually at this point in molarity because we have not added any sodium hydroxide. So nothing is changing in terms of the volume. So we could just use the initial molarity that the weak acid was. This would be zeros. This would be minus X. So we will use X's here, plus X plus X. This would be our initial concentration, minus X, X and X. So it's really just a basic Ka type problem at this point, which obviously would go into our Ka expression, which in this particular example would be this guy. That would equal the Ka value, which most likely would be provided to you. Obviously in this case, we would solve for X. You know, you can make an assumption, whatever you need to do to solve for X like we've done before. The important part of that, if we look at our ice table, X, as we can see, is equal to the H plus concentration. So once we solve for X, that does give us the H plus concentration. And really at this point, that is all we need to calculate the pH minus the log of the H plus. So. You can see already that this titration curve a little bit different in terms of how we calculate the pH. In the previous one, we were starting with a strong acid, so that gave us the H plus concentration. So we could go right into the pH. But here, because we are starting with a weak acid, it will require one ice table uh, basically to figure out the H plus concentration, and then that will get you to your pH. Any questions on that part of it there? So what happens once we sort of start the titration here? So from the very first sort of drop, if you will, until we reach the equivalence point or right before we reach the equivalence point, we are going to obviously get a reaction that's going to occur between the acetic acid and the sodium hydroxide here and we will get really our titration to start. So looking at our second part here, which is again, once we start dropping to before the equivalence point, we are going to get, and we're obviously going to be before the equivalence point here. We will have our reaction, which means we do need to do an ice table. So in this case, it would not be hydrochloric acid because that clearly is the wrong acid in this case. But uh, we would actually take the right acid. Let's try that again. Uh, That's acetic acid in this case. There we go. And our sodium hydroxide. Here we're going to get an acid-base reaction, really double displacement. So we will get some sodium acetate as the ion switch partners. And we'll get uh, some water here, H2O. Uh, 
at this point. Now, when I do this, as I start dropping the sodium hydroxide, do I need to do this ice table in molarity or moles? This one does need to be done in moles. Again, we're adding volume, so we don't want to do it in molarity. So just like before, I'm, I'm just going to kind of make up a number here. So again, we're starting with the acetic acid where we are adding our sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to start with my four moles. So if I am before the equivalence point, should the moles of sodium hydroxide be less than, equal to, or more than the acetic acid? Should be less. So remember, the way to remember that is at the equivalence point, they're equal. So in order to get to that, you have to add to get there. So you should be below there right before you get there. So we will make up the same number. We'll go with two. Seems like a nice lucky number there. And this would be zero. So at this point, what's going to happen is we definitely have enough of the acetic acid. It is like our excess reagent and our sodium hydroxide at this point is our limiting reagent. That means that the change here would be minus two moles, minus two moles, plus two moles. That is going to get us two moles for this guy, nothing for this guy, two moles for this guy. Any questions here on the ice table? Trust me when I tell you, and I told you before, you should definitely convert it back to molarity at this point even though in some cases it might be okay, but just good practice. So we will convert both of these guys back to molarity, obviously using the total volume, right? To do that, convert it to liters. Total volume obviously being how much, in this case, acid you started with and how much sodium hydroxide you added to get to this point in the titration. So now if you are not sure how to get to the pH after this ice table. Once again, don't overlook what's in the ice table. We are left with basically this guy, sodium acetate and acetic acid. Are these two things related to each other? These two things are related to each other. That is like a weak acid and is conjugate base. That is also known as what type of solution? Starts with a B and a U. It is a buffer solution. There's a couple of Fs, I think, in there as well, if I keep spelling it. So that is a buffer. So as your earlier question, when we look at these two things, they are related to each other basically by the said lowry definition. The sodium really is just like a spectator ion, right? So we got acetic acid and acetate, which is basically a difference of 1H+. plus. Weak acid conjugate base, that is your basic definition of a buffer, right? And that's how we know that. So that's very helpful if we know it's a buffer because we know a way that we can get the pH, which is to use what in this case? We could use the henderson hasselbach equation at this point. The pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. So this is the correct place to actually use the henderson hasselbach equation. We have two numbers, and more importantly, the two numbers are for things that are actually related to each other that make a buffer. Just like we talked about with buffers, if you chose not to use the henderson hasselbach you could lay up a second ice table in place of it if you're comfortable doing that. The second ice table, I'll go with R, you could do a second ice table, which is really just the weak acids, a Ka problem at this point. The important part here is when you take your initial, which by the way, would come from above. That guy would come down here, this would be zero. And to make sure that you're really doing a buffer, you need the other guy that should come over here. The rest of it would be X's. And obviously your molarity minus X, X molarity plus X. Obviously you solve for X, that's your H plus, and then you could go into the pH. Probably less room for error if you go that way, because it's very common people zero out this guy, and then you're not really doing a buffer again, you're just doing a weak acid sort of problem. But that is the other option as you get there. So when we are before the equivalence point, 
anywhere from the very first drop until right before you hit the equivalence point. It requires you to do one ice table. At the conclusion of that ice table, you should convert it back to molarity. And if you do it correctly, you should always have, in this case, a buffer that's acidic, actually, just so you know, which means afterwards, you basically, you're going to use that ice table to get the components of your buffer. You can go into your, your Henderson Hasselbach and you'll be good. Alternative two ice tables, no Henderson Hasselbach is your other option. Any questions before the equivalence point? Okay, so let's then talk about what happens when we do reach now the actual equivalence point here. So in this type of titration, the third part, which is at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point, we are obviously going to get our reaction. So once again, we will have our acetic acid. We will have our sodium hydroxide doing a little reacting there. Once again, we're gonna get a little sodium acetate formed plus some water. So once again, I'm just gonna make up these numbers, starting with this guy, adding that guy. We're gonna use our four moles for our acetic acid to begin with, which means once I'm at the equivalence point, the moles of sodium hydroxide should be less than, equal to, or greater than. Should be equal to. So as we talked about last time, even if you're not sure, the volume to reach the equivalence point, which is sometimes not given to you, you should know that at the equivalence point, both of those numbers should be the same. What is typically usually given to you is the molarity like of the sodium hydroxide. So as long as you can figure out the moles and the molarity, you could use the molarity equation to figure out the volume you would need to reach the equivalence point. And that's important for at the end. So you can convert it back to obviously molarity. Otherwise, you could use M1V1 equals M2V2, I think, like we talked about last time. As long as it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the acid and the base, everything will work out okay. That would be a zero in this case. At this point, you really can't screw this up, I hope, because there's only one number to choose. So you would choose that number. That means when we reach equilibrium, zero, zero, and four moles. Once again, we're going to use the total volume to convert ourselves back into molarity at this case. As we would expect at the equivalence point, which is pretty much the definition of it, we used up basically both our acid and base because we have equal amounts of it. Any questions on the ice table? At this point, we can again use it to help us understand what is there and we are left with a salt. So whenever we are left with a salt, we do have to think about, will this salt continue to react and go through hydrolysis like we talked about? So that is my question to you. Will this salt continue to react and go through hydrolysis? I see a shaking of a head, yes, and I agree with the head that is shaking that it is yes in this case. And that is because what we have left is sodium acetate, which basically gives us two things, a sodium ion and an acetate ion. Which one goes through hydrolysis? It is the acetate. Again, the sodium is a neutral salt. I know this because the acetate comes from acetic acid, which is a weak acid, which means it will be relatively strong and go through hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means it will react with the other guy that is there, which is H2O basically hanging out in the beaker. So what happens at the equivalence point here is much, much different than what happens in a strong acid, strong base titration, where you just lay up a seven and move on with your life. We actually have to do not one ice table, but you need to do two ice tables here. The second ice table is actually going to be a hydrolysis problem where the acetate will react with the water. Now, if you're not sure what's going on, the acetic acid is where it comes from, which means this is a weak acid, which means the acetate would be a base. Definition of a base is it will accept an H plus, which means we should expect the H plus to travel over to the acetate. It will then make acetic acid, 
and it will make hydroxide here. So even before I finish the problem, I should already know my pH should be acidic, basic, or neutral at this point. Should be basic. I also know when I do a calculation, this calculation should be a K1. Yeah, we need a KB. Probably in this titration problem, you're not given the KB, but you're given the KA of acetic acid. This is where we use our KW is equal to KA times KB here to convert it. The initial concentration here comes from above. Yeah, so the molarity above. This table actually will be zeros and X's. Here we're going to solve for X, but in this particular table, X equals what? It equals the hydroxide, right? And we obviously wanna make sure we're using a KB and that would equal the hydroxide concentration, which means we could get ourselves to the POH, but then we also got to then get ourselves to the pH in this particular case. So as you can see in this type of titration, much, much different than the other type of titration, a lot more going on here. But what it tells us is whenever you take any type of combination of a weak acid and you titrate a strong base into it, at the equivalence point, it will always be basic because that weak acid will always produce a salt that will go through hydrolysis and produce hydroxide. So the equivalence point in a basic is basic in this type of titration. That is why when you use phenolphthalein in probably their previous titration experience, you used it because it works between a pH of 8.3 and 10, which is basic. And that's also why they would yell at you that, hey, you know, you want just the lightest color pink because that puts you near the 8.3, which is a probably around where the equivalence point would be in most of those titrations, the equivalence points like an 8.6-ish or something like that, 8.7 in that ballpark. And that's why you want the lightest color pink. Any questions on either of those things here? So at the equivalence point, it does require two ice tables always. First ice table is really just to get the concentration of your salt. The second ice table is basically a hydrolysis problem. So let's then talk about what happens as we go once again past the equivalence point. And as you can see here at the equivalence point in this particular example, the pH is about 8.7, which is basic. So let's talk about that you go past the equivalence point. Again, that indicator doesn't slow you down. You just keep dropping some base. And what's high, what happens here at the fourth part, which is after the equivalence point. So once again, we still have our titration occurring, which is our acetic acid and our sodium hydroxide making our sodium acetate and our water here. Once again, we will do our made up before moles. We are starting with this guy and we are adding this guy. So clearly if I am past the equivalence point, my moles of sodium hydroxide should be more than what I'm starting with. So we'll just go with six in this example, made up and zero that. Once again, like in the previous titration, we see sort of a switch that occurs. And what happens now is once again here, it's going to be the acid that is going to be our limiting reagent. Remember, you gotta take the smaller number, otherwise you get negative, which you can't have. So that's gonna be actually the moles of our acid that's going to be our change. That means at equilibrium, zero, two moles and four moles. Once again, here, we're going to use the total volume to convert back to molarity at this point. So we'll divide everybody by the total volume in liters to get our molarity. Any questions on that ice table there? 
Now, once again, if you're not sure what's going on, we could use our ice table for a little bit of clarity, maybe. We do have sodium hydroxide and sodium acetate. Is that a buffer? That is not a buffer. Again, they are not related to each other in that sense. So we do have two things. So we just talked about at the equivalence point that clearly this guy's gonna go through hydrolysis and it's going to act as a base, right? But we also have this guy over here, which is a strong base. So between the sodium acetate, which is a base, this is gonna go through hydrolysis and the sodium hydroxide, which is a base, which one is the stronger base? It is the sodium hydroxide is a stronger base. Why is this a stronger base? Because pretty much once it goes for a swim, is this going to break apart, right? And again, produce hydroxide really quickly. The sodium acetate, the acetate part has got to go find a water, right? It's got to do a little reaction and produce some hydroxide. So although the sodium acetate will produce some hydroxide, the major contributor of hydroxide at this point is really coming from the sodium hydroxide from your burette that you're just dropping in. Because every time it splashes into the solution, hydroxide goes in basically, right? So what we typically do here is pretty much ignore the contribution of the salt at this point, because once again, it, it is going to be the sodium hydroxide or the strong base that's going to be the major contributor. That makes the calculation much easier because this then gives us our OH minus concentration, which will allow us to get to the POH and thus allow us to get to the pH. So since the strong base is really going to be the major contributor to the OH minus concentration here. Uh, we basically ignore always the salt contribution past the equivalence point. The reason we don't ignore obviously the salt concentration at the equivalence point is there's no sodium hydroxide there, right? It's zeroed out at the equivalence point. So in terms of the only thing that's really affecting the pH at the equivalence point is the salt. So we can't ignore it at that point. But here we do actually have two bases and sodium hydroxide is a much, much stronger base. So after the equivalence point, you need to do a one ice table in moles. Purpose really of this ice table is what we see here to figure out the concentration of the strong base you got left over and thus you could get to the POH and then to the pH. Any questions on that there? So very similar for spots, but very, very different in terms of the calculation that you need to do, depending on where you're at. The good news is these are all calculations we've done previously. The bad part and the hard part for most people is to decide what type of calculation you should do. That is why it's good to know exactly where you are in the titration, because if you know like, hey, I'm before the equivalence point, I should end up in a buffer situation. So I should know what I'm doing before I pick up my pen to try to do the calculation. If you're past the equivalence point, right, you should know you should have a strong base left over. If you're at the equivalence point, you should have some type of hydrolysis situation happening. So it's really helpful. And people always sort of go over that part and just go, I don't really care exactly where I'm at in the titration curve. But it's kind of like directions, I suppose, right? If you know where you're going, it makes it easier to get there. If you got some direction, if you just get in the car and drive, sure, you might get there, but it might take you all day. Yes. And the same thing with these type of calculations. If you just kind of go into it, not really thinking about where you're at or where you should be doing in terms of calculation, you could go down a lot of side streets when you could have just hopped on the freeway and got there, you know, at the right, very quickly. Yes. Yeah. I just, I just made up. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be, give, it would be given in a problem like the previous example we just did, like, you know, you would have the volume and the molarity calculated. It would be, in some cases, it may not be like, it would be in most of the problems, except for perhaps at the equivalence point. So it's very common in books and stuff. 
that they will just simply say, what is the pH at the equivalence point? And they may not give you the volume. So that's what we talked about that you may have to kind of figure out how much volume for that particular guy to get there. Everywhere else, they will give you the volume of both because they'll just say simply like, hey, you, what's the pH after you add like 10 mils of it or something like that. So everywhere except for the equivalence point is commonly sometimes not given to you the volume. And you sometimes have to figure out it. It would work because what you would definitely be given, for example, in this type of titration is uh, the volume of the acid and the molarity of the acid. So you would know the moles of the acid that you'd have. And that's what I was saying. That's one way you could figure out how much volume of the other guy you would need is you would then know that the base should be the exact same number. And what you would be given for the base is always the molarity of it. So then you can use the molarity and the moles to figure out the volume. So that's one way you can do it. And like I said, you can do it at one V1 equals M2 V2. Our really quick shortcut is if the molarity of both the acid and the base are exactly the same, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship, you need the exact same volume to reach the equivalence point. Yeah. Do you have to distinguish the graph through separation? You should know what they look like. Um, if your question is, would you just get a graph and I'm going to ask you, is it a weak acid or weak base? I'm going to say yes, in theory, because the difference would be if, for example, you were given a graph and the equivalence point was pointed out to you where the pH was, for example. If the equivalence point was at seven, you would know that it should be a strong acid, strong base. If the equivalence point was some type of basic pH, when you look at the graph, then you should know it should be a weak acid and strong base. So in that sense, yeah, you should be familiar with what they look like and sort of what you would expect at different parts along the way. Yeah, other questions? <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's, let's take another look at one here and just I'll make one up here that goes with this type of titration. So what is the pH if we... Uh, if we had 25 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar acetic acid and um, let's see here just do and we added 23 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. The Ka value for acetic acid, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. All right, go for it. see how we're doing. So obviously we have started the titration since we've added 23 milliliters of uh, 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. Uh, so we do want to do it in moles. So we are also going to uh, have our reaction, which is our acetic acid plus our sodium hydroxide here. making our sodium acetate and our water here. So again, we wanna do it in moles. So just like we calculated moles earlier, 0 0.025, which converts our milliliters into liters times 0.1, gives us 0 0.0025 moles of our acetic acid. 0 0.023 converts our milliliters into liters times 0.1 for the sodium hydroxide gives us 0 0.0023 moles of this guy and zero this. Now, again, as we talked about, it's good to know sort of where you're at. So am I before, at, or after the equivalence point? I am before, once again, we are starting with this guy. We are adding this guy. And I have more of what I started with than what I added. So that means what I started with is above what I'm adding. So I am before reaching the equivalence point. So we are before the equivalence point. Really, uh, 
at this point, you should know how this ends. So let's see if we do know how this ends. Because we are before the equivalence point, the change here should be the sodium hydroxide. It is the limiting reagent. So we should have 0 0.0023 minus 0 0.0023 and a plus 0 0.0023. That is going to get us uh, <clears throat> 0 0.0025 minus 0 0.0023, 0 0.0002 moles. That's going to zero out 0 0.0023 moles over here. At this point, we do want to convert it back into molarity. Our total volume is, again, we started with 25 milliliters. We added 23 milliliters to it. So that looks like 48 milliliters is our total volume. That means we want to divide these guys by converting that into liters. So that would be 0 0.048 liters by both of them here. And if we do that 0 0.0002 divided by 0 0.048 gets us 0 0.00417, we'll call it, uh, 0 0.0023 divided by 0 0.048 uh, gets us a 0 0.0479 molar. Any questions on the ice table? So let's just say that knowing that you're before the equivalence point and maybe you didn't think about that, but you get to this point and we need to figure out what's going on. Looking at what we have left at the equivalence point, are these two things related to each other? What are these two things? That is a buffer, which is what we should have expected to end up with just by knowing we were before the equivalence point in this type of titration. So this is good because if you didn't end up with something like this, you did something wrong at this point. That also tells us that, frankly, we know at this point we could just go into the Henderson Hasselbach equation. So the pKa value here minus the log of the Ka, which would be minus the log 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, gives you like a 474 action. That means that our pH is equal to our pKa plus the log of the base over the acid, gets us a 474 plus the log, which one is my base? Yeah, it's the sodium acetate's our base. That obviously is acetic acid, so that should be my acid. So that is 0 0.0479, 0 0.00417. And if we do that here, divided by 0 0.00417, Take the log of it, add a 474 to it. Yeah, it looks like perhaps a 5.80 here would be our pH at this point. Again, you could do a second ice table instead of the Henderson Osbach uh, using acetic acid and the molarity, um, but you make sure you gotta use both molarities. Any questions on any part of that there? We can kind of see how we did, what did we have 23? This is just titration here. So we ended up with 5.8. So that is between those two numbers. So that's good. Didn't screw that example up. So that's good. So any questions on this type of titration? So again, you can see it is uh, very different than the strong acid, strong base titration. So all titration problems are not the same. You need to make sure you understand what type of acid and base you're dealing with as it is different calculations, um, depending on what you have going on. The good news, like I said, is it's really calculations that you've done before. You just got to make sure you understand how to apply it and when to apply it correctly here. Any questions on that there? Okay, so uh, we will look at the last type of titration that we're going to talk about, which is actually a strong acid weak base titration. So this titration is a little bit different. In this particular case, uh, we have the actual strong acid up here in the burette, so like our HCl, and we're actually adding it to a weak base down in the beaker like our NH3. 
So this titration curve looks a little bit different and it's because we're starting with a base. So that is why we are starting high up there on top and we're actually adding acid. So we're dropping down as we continue through this titration. So the same four points that we talked about previously, point one, point two before the equivalence point, point three at the equivalence point, and once again, point four, which is technically past the equivalence point. Uh, we have a very similar type of situation occurring. So let's take a look at really uh, the first part here, which is before we start the titration. And that means that we have no HCl added at this point. So once again, the only thing that we have before we start the titration in this case is actually a weak base. And if I wanted to calculate the pH of a weak base, I would do a KB problem. So in this case, we would be an NH3 plus some water. Since it's a base, it's going to accept the H plus and make NH4 plus and OH minus. You can put them together and make NH4OH if you want to keep them together or keep them apart, however you want to do that in this particular case. This is going to be an ice table and we would use the initial molarity here because we have not added any acid at this point. So we don't have to worry about moles. And this would obviously be zeros, minus x plus x plus x, which means when we get to the end there, we have our initial minus x, x and x. This is obviously a KB problem. So we would go into our KB expression here, which would be our NH4 plus, our OH minus divided by our NH3. And that would uh, equal obviously our KV value in this case, which is actually 1.8 times 10 to the minus five as well, believe it or not. But we would solve for X. In this case, we do need to remember looking at the ice table that X is again, not the hydroxide concentrate, not the uh, H plus concentration, but it is the hydroxide concentration. So that would once again, get us to our POH first and then to our pH. So kind of very similar to the previous titration, instead of starting with a weak acid here, we are starting with a weak base, still requires basically an ice table. You approach it just like a normal weak base problem, a KB problem, you use the molarity, you use Xs, you solve for X, again, giving your hydroxide concentration. Thus, obviously, getting you to your pH after you get the pOH. Any questions on that part? So let's take a look at what happens once we do start the titration. So this would be, again, from the kind of the first drop there until we reach the equivalence point. Uh, and again, in this case, we're adding acids, so we are dropping in pH. So basically up at the second spot there, let's talk about what we end up with. So we are before the equivalence point. So uh, we would have a reaction between our NH3, 